Good morning and welcome to your program Empower to Transform. My name is Pastor Charles Nganga and I'm so glad that you tuned in to listen and to view this. Well, Easter has just uh, concluded and I pray that you had a good Easter and that you remember that the central message of Easter is the terrible price that Christ paid so that you and I could be free. Free from guilt, the guilt that is, and the shame that is brought by sin and so that we could live our lives in such a way as to honor God, to serve Him and to serve others. If you forget everything else, please do not forget that the price has been paid for you to be set free. Do not live in the past. Don't live according to the shame and the guilt of what you did in the past. The future is open for you. After Easter, all things are possible. God loves you and He wants you to live a wonderful life. Well, today we're going to change gears a little bit and Pastor Isaac will take us through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 24 following. And this is where Paul teaches us about the Christian race, the race of faith. He talks about or likens this race to an Olympian who goes into strict training, who is disciplined and who is running the race in such a way as to win the prize. This is the kind of race that you and I are in. We need to enter into strict training. We need to be disciplined so that at the end of the race, we can be commended by God as he tells us, well done, good and faithful servant. You have done well. You have done me proud. God bless you as you listen to this message and as you apply with courage and with faith some of the incredible lessons that you will learn today. If you have your Bible, I'd like to ask you to please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We are going to be looking for at verse 24 into chapter 10 up to verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 24 into chapter 10, verse 13. The men's 3,000 meter staple chase is a Kenyan fife dome. We hold it with an iron fist. At no one time have we felt a sense of nationhood than when the 3,000 meter staple chase is run. Since the 1984 Olympics, Kenya has won all the gold medals, eight in total up to now, and the domination in this race is so total that in many other competitions, Kenya tends to dominate. The only blight to our illustrious record is that we have somebody called Saif Saeed Shaheen, formerly Stephen Cherono, <laughs> a Qatari of Kenyan origin, who holds the world record. He's been holding it now for about 10 years. Very, somebody came very close to breaking it last year. Yet despite this incredible record, uh, every four years, we live hoping that we are going to win the next one. And uh, indeed, you are only as good as your last race. A loss in this race is truly unthinkable for many of us Kenyans. I mean, you, you've got to love that picture. It brings out a sense of Kenyan nationhood. Failure is not always looked upon very kindly. Ask David Moyes. <laughs> As we come to the end of uh, this Easter series, we find ourselves in a place where we need to take stock of the great victory that God has brought upon us. Our approach to God has not always been so assured. We started off by looking at the power of sins in our lives, then we looked at the incredible work of God in saving us through the perfect high priest who also happens to be Jesus Christ and was also the perfect sacrifice. And then last week, Elder Noel told us about a God in Jesus who passionately pursues sinners uh, such that we are able to live for more than just the blessings that he gives to us. Indeed, the big question for us now is how then do we live as people who have been redeemed from slavery to sin. Indeed, now that we are out of jail, how are we going to live as free people? Thus, this sermon is uh, split in two parts, where we focus on a race, but also when we are running, we need to be aware that there are obstacles in the race. In many of his writings, Paul is very concerned about Christians and have, uh, about Christians having the right focus. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Let us read together 
26, says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But not we. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Now, this is not an accidental reference by Paul to his audience, but rather it is one that his audience could be able to easily identify with. The Corinthians were very, very familiar with athletic events. There were some very important games that took place every two to three years in their neighborhood, and these games were only second in importance to the Olympic Games in all of Greece. In his exhortation to the Corinthians, he's telling them that they ought to be very focused on the price, even though it is a temporal price. Indeed, people put in a lot of effort in order to be able to get a price. May I say, winning is big business and costs a lot of money. Let me put this into perspective. I am a huge motorsport fan. In fact, uh, if it wasn't for work today, I would probably be at Mega right now watching the rally. And uh, there is a very close correlation between the amount of money you put into motor racing and the results. Red Bull Racing is one of motor, motorsport's biggest spenders. And uh, in 2011, they actually had a budget of about 25 billion Kenya shillings. Out of this, 10 billion went into research and development. Why? To get a crown that would not last. Because a world championship only lasts for a year, and then you go back to square one. This morning, I see many parents with many dreams for their children, including guardians and grandparents. Why do we want so much for our children? Maybe at the heart of this hope is a strong desire for our children to have better lives than our own. So we resonate with such dreams because we are typical parents. In fact, it is expected of parents and guardians to have big dreams for their children. Thus, we put our children in the best schools we can possibly afford or ill afford. We provide them with as many advantages as we possibly can, sometimes even to going overboard. Why? Because like Paul, we have a goal. And sometimes this goal comes every so often on December 28th. It will click tonight. Such a boxer, or rather, the why? And Paul is saying that indeed, when a boxer gets into the ring, he does not fight beating the air because such a boxer is bound to get knocked out in the ring of life. We want to give our children the best because we have a crown, or rather we have something we have in store for them. But there's something else that we only need to recognize. Most of the things that we work for are temporal. Today's newspaper has famously, as we've been told, is tomorrow's meat wrapper. What's hot today is definitely not cool tomorrow. Living in a 24-hour news cycle has the power of making the most serious sometimes look very absurd, and all we live for is hashtags and trending topics, if we are lucky. Yet in view of these comparative values or rewards, one which is temporal, another one which is eternal, Paul says, run the Christian race purposefully, not aimlessly or half-heartedly because he wanted to gain a prize at the judgment seat of Christ. To use a different figure and to make the same point, he did not throw wild punches, but he wanted to make every punch score because that is important. It is not the amount of effort that you put in, but rather it is the way you are able to make your punches land on a target that you score a point. You see, Christian service is not just activity. 
but it is activity that is focused on a target. Today, I see parents who also invited family and friends. How I pray that this is not just an activity that we did because we do, but that there is a very specific target that we have. Indeed, I want to be able to say that for each and every one of us, I hope we have not, sit, we have not sat here because we do this every Sunday, but I want to be able to say that there is indeed a target. You see, the building of the church and the spreading of the gospel is the number one reason why I see so many of you this morning. It is the work of the gospel. Thus, any good athlete will need to recognize the things that will easily stop him or her from achieving the crown. Paul says the Corinthians were becoming spiritually flabby. They had been wanting the rewards without the hard work. They had been more concerned about pleasant surroundings rather than proper training conditions. The streets of the city and the hillsides of Corinth would have been full of athletes training hard in order to be able to gain a crown at these prestigious events. It was self-evident that every athlete needed to exercise self-control in all things. After all, self-control also happens to be a gift or a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if such discipline is crucial to gain a crown that will not last, how about then a crown that will last to eternity. Paul is saying we have to be very careful because indeed there is a place we are going. So even as we enjoy freedom in Christ, even as we now live as Christians, it is important that we never forget that there is a very important and specific target for all of us. So Paul is saying, run to win. Secondly, when you are running, it is important that you are also aware of the obstacles. Please, let's look at verse 10 to 13. Paul says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with them or with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in slavery. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and they were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the age has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure under it. The NIV in chapter 10 is able to tell us to start off the word chapter 10 with 4. Thus, the connection with the foregoing chapter is expressed. Paul in chapter 9 lays the basis of, for why we need to exercise self-control. It is so that we can attain the prize. In chapter 10, he goes on to warn the Corinthians or brethren of the danger of falling away despite having experienced the knowledge of knowing God's goodness in your life. Paul as a good scholar and teacher, gets the perfect example from the life of the history of God's people themselves. And Paul gave a warning to the believer who considered himself strong or herself uh, perfect, an individual who knew that there were no other gods 
but the one true God? That such a person felt fit to accept invitation to a pagan neighbor to dine in a pagan temple. And the Apostle Paul cautioned this group in the Corinthian church because even though there were no other gods, the possibility of participating in idolatry was very real. And thus he drew his lesson from the experience of Israel during the wanderings in the desert. Indeed, it's this, that yes, you are a Christian. And indeed, that's what we do. We are. But in not a long while, we are going to go and file out of that gate. And indeed, we are going to be living in a world out there. But even as we go out, we ought to be very careful that in our interactions with other people, we do not participate in some of the pagan activities. And I will come to that. Before the people of Israel received this physical and spiritual nourishment, i.e., supernatural food and supernatural drink, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The, the use of the word baptized is, of course, highly significant. To be baptized into Moses meant they were voluntarily and unconditionally placing themselves under the leadership of Moses. Paul, or rather Paul's very striking language, which is also very unusual in this passage, emphasizes the parallels between the privileges of God's people in the desert under Moses and the privilege of God's people under Jesus in Corinth and even on us here at Mamlaka Hill Chapel. In both historical epochs or eras, there are two events which are very significant with meaning. Being baptized to denote loyalty to God's appointed leader and being provided with supernatural food and drink on a regular basis. Indeed, to be under Jesus is to know that you have to obey him, but more than that, it is to experience a supernatural provision from him. Paul is certainly comparing the arrogant attitude of God's people under Moses to the arrogance of certain Corinthian Christians in his own day. They too had been through the baptism of water with a deep significance carried uh, to, to have allegiance to Jesus as Lord. They too were involved in regular uh, common meals where they were both nourished physically and also nourished spiritually. But they, had, they also received a lot of blessings. But they were in danger of missing out on the ultimate price. You see, these Christians, like God's people under Moses, were at the end of receiving great blessings, but to receive great blessings by no means does not mean to enter into the privilege and responsibilities of blessing. May I repeat that again? That to receive blessing by, by no means does not mean to enter into the privilege and the responsibilities of blessing. Let me give you a classic Kenyan example. Uh, Kenyans, we love taking our children as possibly as we can to a Christian school. In fact, if you notice carefully, most schools have sent something. Even if you can be able to get St. Isaac somewhere in there, it's a good thing. Because we know that there is a heritage to it. We, we say, you know what? I want my children to gain some Christian uh, values. In fact, I've had many people say, I want my children to have Christian values. The problem is this. Do we know how these Christian values come about? As parents, we need to be able to recognize that indeed, Christian values do not fall from the sky, but they are cultivated in and within us. So it is important that we are able to recognize that these things do not just occur in the air, but they occur through a life of living each and every day under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It is possible, like the Corinthians, to be so absorbed with the rights to, uh, of being a Christian and presume on the relationship with the Lord. Paul's point in these first four verses was that the Israelites were the chosen people of God, just as the Christians are now, uh, are the chosen people of God. But even though they were able to enjoy God's faithful provision, they were in great danger, and indeed many of them fell away in the desert, and we too stand the same fate if we are not careful. Despite all these facts, 
we may experience God's gracious salvation, but we are not allowed to presume on his goodness. Let me give you an example again. Generally, in an athletics meet like the Olympics or the World Championships, it takes two, fin it takes two races to qualify for the final. In the final, you must exert yourself more than ever in order to be able to win the race. I have had it said that sometimes the difference between a gold medal and a silver medal is not ability, but who wants it more. In the final of the 800 meters uh, women's race at the World Athletic Championships in Moscow last year, Maria Savinova was a red-hot favorite. She was, the, she was running at home, she was the Olympic champion, and she still is the Olympic champion. And indeed, everything on paper showed she was going to win. I was watching the race, and I knew she was going to win. But in the last 100 meters, an upstart called Eunice Sum from Kenya appeared to find a second gear and started to forge ahead. Roared to the rafters by a passionate home crowd, Maria Savinova was expected to surely win. But guess what? It was a 25-year-old from Kenya, you known as Unisum, who prior to Moscow had not run outside of Kenya in 2013, who would go on and win Kenya as a prize gold medal. I still remember that race and I get goosebumps because it was totally unexpected. On paper, Savinova should have won the race. She had pedigree, she had home court advantage, and guess what? She was, the, she was the reigning Olympic champion. So she knew how to win. So it is very possible that you can have every single pedigree on your side. You are coming from a background whereby your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, probably you are the people who even provided the piece of land where the church at home is built. <laughs> but guess what? You fall away. And you fall away because sometimes we presume on the privileges of God. Living as people in the light and living as people in freedom, we ought to recognize and to know that we are always in that danger if you're not careful. And what are these dangers? In verse 6 to 10, Paul goes to be able to list some of them. Verse 7, the Israelites participated in idolatry, even though they knew there was only one God. Secondly, they practiced immorality and acted immoral before God, i.e. they actually participated in fornication. Third, they tested the Lord by taxing his patience despite his provision. Fourth, they grumbled frequently against the Lord. In fact, at one time they said, it is better to do what? To go back to Egypt. So we always are in that danger. But I want to be able to say, is there a way out? Out of all this? I want to be able to say that verse 13 offers us great hope. Because it says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Failure is not inevitable. You can actually do, you can, can live in freedom and in victory. The temptations the Corinthians faced were not unique to them because the Lord had also been able to give them a way out of the temptation that they might face. In their context, the temptation was to participate in idolatry in the Greek temples uh, or to participate in immorality and test the Lord's patience through grumbling. But verse 13 covers all manner of temptations that you will ever face. Indeed, I want to be able to say, and I do not want to minimize the fact that as Christians, we face all manner of testings out there. Sometimes to live even on the straight and narrow in this land of freedom, sometimes is very, very difficult. I understand. But the Lord says, no temptation has overtaken you. God himself provides the oppressed and the deeply tried with his exodus. God is not vindictive. 
He is not waiting to hit you with a punishment because you have been insolent. No, we are not on our own. We are with him in every situation, just like many other countless people out there for whom testing is equally the same, if not more, and nerve-wracking. It is the already assured salvation achieved through Christ's work on the cross that enables us to endure. And so sometimes we find ourselves needing to compromise on one or two areas. Or sometimes we may say, well, pastor, I don't think if there are any idols in my life, I want to be able to say there can be. Sometimes it is in terms of maybe wanting to advance all the more, the more, the more in our careers, the point whereby we don't even have time for our children or time even for God's word. It happens. In fact, I want to be able to say, I am recognizing that people like you have come to church are actually in the minority more and more. Once or twice I've had a chance to stay at home on a Sunday, and I'm amazed by the sheer number of people in Nairobi who no longer go to church. So you actually are beginning to become a minority. On this very important day in our church calendar, as we dedicate children and invite them into our church family, I hope we realize that for all of us, there is a promised help to help them grow in faith and in the knowledge of God. And so as parents, do not be too scared about how to provide. So you don't need to burn the midnight oil every single day in order to be able to provide for your children. The Lord is there for us. We need not to be able to sacrifice ourselves sometimes at the altar of wanting to advance in many other areas because most of the things that we want in this world are very temporal. But let me also say that let's not kid ourselves. We have promised that we are going to help the children to grow in faith in Jesus. But I want to appreciate the fact that we live in a world in which many people no longer have regard for God. They no longer believe in God. And I know that maybe some of us who are here today, you were dragged here because of the child being dedicated. My brother, my sister, may I address you at this moment. I would like to tell you that indeed, God loves you, and there's a great salvation for you too. You can be able to experience incredible joy and a hope because all that the world provides is very, very temporal. It doesn't last. My brother, my sister who is here, sometimes almost by accident, may I tell you that sin is real, but God has dealt with it, and you can start to enjoy life in Christ even now. And even for you, my brother, my sister, who is watching at home, may I tell you that sin is real, but God has dealt with it, and you can start to enjoy life in Christ, even where you are at this moment as you watch. Because all that the world gives ultimately is perishable in the long run. For those of us who already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, may I say that uh, verse 1 to 13 deals with the dangers involved in participating in pagan activities because that is the word for the world system out there because it has no regard for God. And some of these activities may not look wrong in and of themselves. After all, it is good to progress. It is good to do well. But when that becomes the thing that defines your life, then you're in danger. For some of the parents, our children too can become an idol if all our focus is on them and them only all the time. We need to have a focus that is far much bigger than ourselves. If we do participate in such activities, we need to be aware that doing so is to walk on the edge of a cliff over which many the believers have fallen, including the Israelites in the wilderness. We dare not underestimate the danger of the situation or overestimate our own ability to handle it. You cannot be able to handle your everyday living by yourself. You need God. You need to work closely with God every day. We all know what our pet, pagan, and idolatrous activities are. It's not for me to tell you. Rather, the Holy Spirit will convict you. But I've mentioned a few. But I want to be able to say, all is not lost. For we can rejoice and tell others 
of what the Lord has done for us. For in every situation, he offers a way out for us. Indeed, I want people to say that we can be able to enjoy freedom in Christ and be able to live in such a way that every single day is full of joy because we are no longer in the prison of sin. Indeed, because of the cross, we are free. We are free from all the prisons that we will ever experience in our lives. And so this morning, I want us to be able to make a prayer. In this race of the Christian walk, it is very easy sometimes to lose focus of the crown. Sometimes the obstacles that lie in front of us are so many and we are discouraged. But we thank you, Father, and we glorify you because we know deep inside you are our friend. How I pray, especially for a brother or a sister who is here this morning and does not have a relationship with you, or probably the relationship has gone cold over time and they have slowly found themselves going back to prison. My Father and my God, I pray and I ask that you'd help even at this moment to experience freedom afresh. But Lord, as I want to pray for many of us who even though we are free, sometimes we still have the jail mentality in our hearts. We are sometimes, my Father and my God, caught up in the things of this world. Dear God, help us to be able to stay focused on who you are. We thank you, Father, for these children that have been dedicated this day. I thank you, Father, for the family of Mamlaka, which has grown even more today. How I pray that Jehovah God, that even as we come to the end of this Easter series, you would be honored and glorified. And I pray for our brothers and sisters who are watching at home even at this moment. Would you touch a brother or a sister who feels very weary and who is so lost that Jehovah God, even at this moment, they can experience freedom. We thank you and we glorify you. In Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Amen. I hope you've been challenged by today's message. And I hope that you will take seriously the way you're running your race. Are you running in such a way as to win the prize? Paul says he's not, that he doesn't fight like one beating the air. He has focus and he has purpose. This is the way we ought to be running our race. And there's even a good reason, even a better reason for us to run well. Remember that we are told that the athletes here, they run to win a prize that is temporary, that will fade away. But we run to win a crown of glory that will never fade away. It's an eternal crown and eternal prize. So let's put every effort to win the prize that God has promised, one of eternal glory. And if God makes such a promise, just imagine how incredible that prize is going to be because it's predicated upon a God who does not lie. I hope that you will take this seriously and do everything that you and I can so as to glorify God in the way we live in this life. God bless you.